Welcome everyone. This is the Game Changer Seminar Series of the International Space Science Institute in Bern. My name is Mark Sargent. I'm the ISI Science Program Manager. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome today to our speaker, Andrea Merloni, who will talk about the Erosita instrument. So Andrea did his undergrad at La Sapienza in Rome and then moved to the UK for his PhD, which he did at the University of Cambridge with Andy Fabian. He got his PhD in 2002 and then moved to Germany to the Garching area where he has stayed ever since. First with a research fellowship at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysik, MPA, and then uh, after a few years, he moved to MPE, so the Max Planck for Extraterrestrische Physik, and he has served as, uh, and this is relevant for today's talk, of course, Erosita project scientist for nine years, from 2011 to 2020, and in 2020 took over PI ship of Erosita. But uh, Andrea, of course, is, is his interests are not only limited to X-ray astronomy. He is very active in multi-wavelength survey science in general, for instance, in the Cosmos survey or spectroscopic surveys like STSS-5 or foremost. And in fact, uh, one of Andrea's most important contributions to the field, uh, his paper on the fundamental plane of black holes, uh, is an example of such a multi-wavelength effort where he combines radio emission and X-ray emission from black holes with uh, masses from stellar masses to all the way to supermassive black holes, like the one in M87, which we heard about in this Game Changer series just a couple of weeks ago. So Andrea, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Um, we're looking forward to your talk of bubbles, filaments, echoes, and eruptions. First results from Erosita on SRG. And uh, I will keep track of all questions that come in. So for the audience, you can ask questions either by placing them in the chat or by raising your hand. And when Andrea has finished speaking, we will uh, take those in turn. The floor is yours, Andrea. We're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for the kind introductory words and thank you all for the invitation. It's a very pleasure, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to tell you about the first science result from a relatively new uh, eye on the X-ray sky, the Rosita telescope on, on spectrum ground and gamma mission. My task for today is relatively straightforward. I will uh, spend a few minutes to give you uh, some basic information about the instrument and the mission. Uh, of course, uh, also some update on where we stand in, in the mission right now and how we have been doing in operations. But of course, then spend, I would say, the majority of my time giving you some selected highlights from our early phase of observation, mainly from our so-called performance verification phase, and then also from the main uh, program we are executing right now, which is an old sky survey in X-ray events. So this one is really the one single motivational uh, slide to explain you uh, what, what has driven the design of Erosita. Uh, as I hope I will convince you, we have built a telescope which is, which is capable to cover very wide field of astrophysics, but as often is the case, you need a focus point in order to consolidate your design and also to get the funding from your funding agencies. And for us, for us, this focus point was cosmology using clusters of galaxies. The idea can be explained quite simply looking at this plot on the left. These are um, relatively old uh, dark matter simulation of the filamentary structure, large scale structure of the universe. What you see here are slices through this cosmic web uh, at different uh, times, different epochs. So high redshift uh, on the left, low redshift on the right, uh, meaning now. 
And these different rows correspond to different possible cosmology uh, set of cosmological parameters. And these simulations have been all designed in order to reproduce the main qualitative topology and statistical properties of the large scale structure in the local universe in the last column. But as you can see, uh, the evolution with time of the cosmic structure is markedly different in these different cosmology. If you look at the simplest possible statistics, so the zeroth order uh, one, which is simply counting the knots of this distribution, counting the so called halos in dark matter as a function of time or redshift here, uh, and, and normalizing them to the number that you observed in the local universe. Then you see that the no simple number of objects, uh, halo uh, bigger than a given mass, uh, uh, depends quite sensitively to cosmology. Here you see different uh, uh, value for the density of dark matter or the density of ordinary matter. And here you see how different these uh, number density are at, uh, as a function of redshift, log, the y-axis here is logarithmic. Okay, and uh, how can we see these uh, dark matter halos? Well, we know that they, uh, in, in forming and collapsing under gravity, they trap the gas and this gas gets uh, heated to virial temperature of the order of millions or tens of millions of degrees. And at this temperature, the main emission mechanism is X-ray, is Bremsstrahlung in the X-ray band. So an X-ray telescope is very good at detecting the most massive structures in the universe. And so the Rosita design, essentially it's uh, collecting area and uh, angular, since, uh, angular uh, separation capabilities were driven by the desire to detect at least hundred thousands of this cluster up to redshift one, because we know that with this number, we can constrain this cosmological parameter quite accurately. So this is the, the few words uh, um, description of, of what we wanted to do. Of course, in terms of programmatics from the old project, um, this has a longer and more complex history. If Erosita was uh, approved by the German Space Agency in 2007, and then uh, uh, a memorandum of understanding between the German and the Russian space agencies was signed in 2009, that would have put Erosita on the Spetum Röntgen Gamma mission uh, together with an ARD X ray telescope. The SRG mission in itself in, East, in Russia has a long history. It dates from the late 80s, a mission with the same name. Uh, aimed at X-ray astronomy was already in the books of the Soviet Union space program in the late 80s, but this didn't survive the crisis, the funding crisis of the Russian space science after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it was only revived in the late uh, 2000s after the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. Um, uh, here I'm, I'm also quoting the name of the few leading figure, figures in the development of the mission, Rashid Sunyaev, who is the lead scientist of for SRG in Russia, and Peter Predel, who has been the PI of Irozita for throughout its full development phase for almost 15 years. Mikhail Pavlinsky, who sadly passed away just one year into the mission, he was the PI of the other instrument, Artexi. And, and Paul Nander was the director of MP, uh, who's also essentially been managing the uh, mission development. And this is particularly important because for a mission of this size, uh, MP had a huge amount of uh, responsibilities. Uh, we not only were the lead science institute for Rosita and we did the project management, but we'd also designed the instrument and manufactured most of the flight parts. We did all the integration of Rosita at MP and the testing at the MP facilities. Uh, and now we are we are responsible for handling the data processing and archiving them. So for a single institute uh, is definitely a, a, an amazing effort. But of course we have uh, uh, collaboration from other German institutions that support uh, our work on Erosita, plus of course industry contracts. Okay, so what did we build? Now a nice pictures taken at Baikonur a few days before the launch where you see uh, the spacecraft, it's called Navigator. It was developed by N. Paula Vochkin in Russia. Here you see the folded solar panel. Here, the, everything is mounted on the upper stage of the rocket that was used to bring the spacecraft to its final orbit. And here you see the two telescopes. So there are two scientific payload. 
The Rosita is here on top, this hexagonal structure, covered, of course. It's the largest of the two telescopes. Uh, and uh, Artex C, Michael Pavlinsky Artex C, is a smaller telescope. It's a PI instrument of the Russian um, um, Academy of Science Space Institute, ICI, and it operates complementary to Rosita in the hard X ray energy band above four kilo electron volt, while the Rosita most sensitive band, as I will show you, is a, a lower X ray energy. So the characteristics of Erosita are now summarized in this single slide. Now we are looking at the hardware at MPE before the final integration is essentially what I showed you before removing, uh, be, uh, before we put in the cover. So here on the left, you see the telescope entry. So Erosita is not a single X-ray telescope, but it's an array of seven identical telescopes. They technologically are uh, the children of the XMM Newton the, ESA, the, the flagship ESA X-ray mission in terms of the uh, mirror technology development. Differently from XMM Newton, however, uh, the Erosita X-ray mirrors have a larger field of view, as I will show you in a minute why that is important, a one degree diameter. But the optical performance that you can see here during our test campaign at MP, so this is a mapping of the PSF, a point, so how a point source gets distorted by our uh, way of focusing X-rays. Uh, the PSF has similar performance as XMM Newton on axis, of course. The, there is degradation, optical degradation as you move away from the optical axis. Uh, but when you average over the field of view, our uh, alpha energy width uh, of the PSF is about 30 arc second. Th that allows us to position sources with an accuracy of about 4.5 arc second. Uh, on the right, you see the detector plane, uh, the seven identical mirror system, focus X-rays in seven identical detectors. They are also an evolution of the very successful PN CCD technology that have been used on the XMM Newton. We have made a few improvements with, with respect to the PN CCDs. For example, we have a frame store that remove out of time events. We have no chip gaps, so the entire CCD is exposed to X-rays, as you can see in this image. The level of noise is very low and uniform. The detector has very little temperature dependency. In total, we have about a million pixels distributed over the seven detectors. Each pixel is about 9.4 9 arc second in size. And the uh, quality of the detectors is also testified by uh, the ability to assign energy to photons. So. In X-rays, when you take images, at the same time you can take spectra. Uh, we, I mean, we do a so-called integral field uh, spectroscopy, and we can our spectral resolution, energy resolution, is about a factor of 1.5 to 2 better than XMM Newton, uh, or a, a, around the fact res resolving power of 20, so 80 electron volt at 1.5 kilo. Uh, so um, here is a comparison of the main metric, how, how big a collecting uh, area does this telescope have? Uh, in red is the Erosita 7 mirror system combined. And here it's compared with the other X-ray missions. The XMM3 instrument, PN and MOS are in blue. So in the, sen in the energy range between, let's say, 0.3 kilo electron volt and 2.3 kilo electron volt, the Erosita system is as large as XMM Newton. It's in fact the largest both of them together are the largest X-ray telescopes that have uh, been operating in space um, until now. Um, but of course, the big advantage, you know, it's the combination of a large collecting area and the large field of view. So here you see a comparison of the Erosita field of view with the XMM Newton and Chandra, the two largest X-ray telescopes currently operating. Uh, one led by NASA, uh, Chandra, and one led by ESA, XMM Newton. And here you see the field of view of Erosita, which is significantly larger. In addition to that, we have designed our operations and uh, so that we can optimize wide field imaging. One way of doing that is to introduce a, a way of uh, serving rectangular fields in this so-called raster scan mode. Instead of pointing at stair, we can continuously move the telescope recording the arrival time of each photon. And this allowed to build very uniform images over large areas that no other X-ray telescope could do before us. This is an example, one of the most spectacular images that we took in our first months of operation. This is an X-ray image of a few degrees inside center on a system of interacting clusters of galaxy. 
I will describe you in more detail what we have found in this image, but I think here is just for you to appreciate, uh, so to speak, the beauty of this X-ray image that can rival optical telescope, optical images. Okay, now let me go back to our launch. This took place uh, on July 13 from Baikonur in extremely hot days. The proton rocket uh, launch was perfect and it brought uh, SRG into this very large halo orbit around L2, um, which is the same similar to uh, Gaia or Herschel. Um, so it's, it's a favorite place for continuous sky observation, especially for survey instruments. Uh, we are the first X-ray X-ray telescope that operates at L2. So we are learning something about the L2 environment for X-ray astronomy. I will tell you in a second a few things about that. But let me just give you one slide recap of where we stand in terms of our instrument. The main message of this is that all the subsystem are working. Uh, most of them are working uh, following uh, according to spec. We have at least two uh, issues to deal with, which uh, don't really affect much our science return, but uh, uh, affect our operation. Uh, one is uh, slightly uh, lower performance of our thermal system, so our cameras are operating slightly warmer than they were supposed to at around minus between minus eighty five and minus eighty two instead of minus ninety. We have a large number of single uh, 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 upset events uh, from particle that interacts with our complex camera electronics uh, that cause periodic reset of one of the seven electronic uh, cameras, uh, which means a short interruption of uh, our ability to take data with that camera. Typically, this happens once or twice per week. So we lose, we lose a small fraction, small percentage of our observing time. And then two other issues that we have, two of the cameras are affected by uh, light leak, maybe from a uh, design fault. So this is sunlight that entered through some scattering onto the detector. This essentially is UV light. It does not really uh, modify your X-ray. Uh, it doesn't affect X-ray imaging but it changed the energy response of the detector. So doing accurate spectroscopy with these two cameras is much more difficult, if not in some cases impossible. And then we have had so far three micrometeorites impacts, which is uh, already more than what XMM had in 20 years, uh, affecting three different cameras. Uh, two were quite minor with only a few handful of pixels affected, but in one case for TM4, we have a few thousand pixels that are affected. Uh, not all are unusable, but uh, this makes uh, the operation of this camera a little bit more cumbersome. I told you we are exploring the X-ray background at L2. Here is a plot of the rate of medium ionizing particle measured by Rosita. This is actually quite similar to what Gaia measures at L2. Here you see, in fact, the rate is quite stable over the first uh, year and a half of the mission. Here you see a plateau which corresponds to solar minimum. You know, this, these are essentially cosmic rays that interacts with your instrument and they, their rate is theoretically expected to be anti-correlated with solar activity. In the sense, the stronger the solar activity, uh, the more the solar wind is pushing back against these uh, cosmic rays. And so we see, in fact, the maximum corresponding to the solar minimum. But in general, the main message is that the variability is very low. It's only a few percent level. And there is a 26 days modulation, which probably has to do with the solar rotation, which is also seen by Gaia. But so there is quite a lot of interesting uh, magnetospheric physics to be learned by our measurements. And, and this is now a spectrum of the background on the left. Uh, the red is the particle background, essentially this uh, provoked by the same sort of events that I've shown you before. And the black is the cosmic background uh, due to either Milky Way diffuse emission or uh, cosmic uh, sources at cosmic distances. The main point is that our measured particle background is higher than we were predicting before launch. And this is probably mostly due to an incorrect modeling of our instrument in full detail, um, but it's extremely stable, at least until now in solar minimal, the background at L2 has been very stable. Here you see a measurement of the background done simultaneously between XMM and Erosita. 
in three different bands, 0.5 to 2.4 to 2kV, 2 to 4.5 and above 4.5. The Erosita background is the red and the XMM Newton is the green and the blue for the two camera systems. So as you can see, the Erosita background is much more quieter and stable than the XMM one, which of course is quite good. Okay, now let me move to give you an overview of the programmatics before moving to the results. As I said, we launched in July 2019. We have spent about two and a half months doing calibration and performance verification. Uh, and in the end of 2019, we started an old sky survey program uh, in which every six months we, we cover the entire sky and we are planning to do that until the end of 2023. So ERAS is the acronym of the Erosita old sky survey. We plan to do eight of them. And after that, enter into a 2.5 years pointed observation with a mix of guarantee time for the instrument teams and geo time open to the community. In the meantime, we have already released a first batch of data taken during the CalPV. This happened last July, it's called early data release. And now we are working towards the data release of the Old Sky Survey. The first one will happen at the end of next year. And then it will be followed by two more uh, data releases, uh, space more or less one year and a half one from each other. Okay, let me now start to show you some highlights from our performance verification phase. This is actually the first light image as seen as on our MP screens on the night where we took for the first time uh, data with the seven cameras all together. This is the same image, but now combined and in its full glory in, in false color. So these are uh, red, green, blue correspond to different X-ray energy of the photons. This uh, field is centered on a very famous supernova, the supernova 1987A that exploded in the large Magellanic cloud in 1987, of course. And what you see here is structure in the diffuse hot gas of the Magellanic cloud. You see supernova remnants, you see bubbles and super bubbles produced by the wind of the hot stars or older the supernova remnants. And of course, you see point sources. These could be foreground stars, background AGN, in some cases, very bright uh, sources. And as a comparison here, I'm showing the first light image of XMM Newton, which was taken in the same field as well. As I said, XMM Newton has a slightly better uh, uh, angular resolution than the average one of Erosita, but a smaller field of view. So you can see that in one go with Erosita, we can cover a larger area. And now a few nice images to highlight the power of this wide field X-ray imaging from Erosita. Here is a beautiful supernova remnant, Kupise. A paper was out on AstroPH last week. Uh, here you, again, you see false X color representing different X-ray energies. I invite you to look at this paper if you want to know how we can learn how different chemical composition of the supernova can leave imprints in the X-ray expanding uh, shells. Here is now a composite of the region around the Magellanic Cloud with our first light image uh, and uh, augmented by a few other pointings of other uh, center and a few other bright sources in the Magellanic Clouds. And this is a zoom in on the spectrum that we took with this image of the supernova remnant itself, 1987A. And this is to emphasize the improvement in spectral resolution between Erosita in Cyan and XMM Newton. So the, the, the white is the XMM Newton spectrum. The statistics is a bit poorer because the source was fainter in XMM Newton time. But uh, the main point is not the smallness of the error bus, but the sharpness of the emission line from different uh, ejecta mat uh, chemical material in the ejecta. And this is now two different clusters of galaxies also exposed with deep exposure with the Rosita more, more than 100 kilosecond. On the left is a merging cluster system. Here it's the Rosita false color image and the inset on the top uh, right is the entropy that you can measure by uh, fitting the spectra in, in small bins of your X-ray image. Because we have such large number of X-ray photons, we can accurately measure entropy and, and in particular entropy disturbances due to the merging process ongoing between these two clusters. And this is the famous coma cluster uh, that uh, we could image out to its virial radius. So we have a full view of the process of formation 
an interaction of the comma cluster. It's particularly striking when you subtract the, the uniform uh, surface brightness profile, then you see the complex residuals which trace the interaction between NG4839, which is a, a subsystem that is interacting with the main body of the comma cluster and producing shocks that we can detect in our X-ray images. And now let me come back to this spectacular uh, merging cluster system. This is not the Rosita image I showed you before. This is a Rosa tall sky survey view in the 0 0.5 to 2 kilo electron volt. XMM Newton had looked at this system with three separate pointings, one center on the northern cluster and one center in the southern cluster couple and one in the middle. And with Rosita, we could cover uh, uh, the entire area uh, to similar depth, but then uh, detecting the entire process of structure formation, if you want, onto these interacting cluster systems. Um, this is the same image, uh, single band color, um, but is uh, so processed to highlight the uh, extended sources. So there are a very large number here with rest process. We see other extended sources we detect in the field of this interacting cluster system. And these are all the ones for which we can measure the redshift uh, consistent with the redshift of the main three clusters. So we are not only focusing on these three merging clusters, but entire process of, of, of structure coming together as predicted by numerical simulations. This is a nice comparison in the paper by Veronica Biffy in which she, they took a hydrodynamical simulation of merging clusters and found the closest analog to the Abel 3391 system. So on the left is a numerical simulation of a merging cluster centered on one of the merging systems extending out to three times the video radius in this case. So really at distances where you can see the interacting between the inflowing uh, matter and the virializing core of these clusters. And here is what our observations show, including uh, with this color scheme, enhanced emission over more than 50 megaparsecs that we interpret as actual evidence of uh, a filament along which these, uh, the few, these lar uh, large clumps are uh, flowing into the emerging cluster system. I think this is quite spectacular demonstration of the power of Irosita for studying large scale structure. The largest investment of time for us during the performance verification phase was actually in a, sorry, in a survey field called, called IFETS. Um, IFETS was observed for about four days. And what we did was essentially to pick up a, a uh, random ex or not a random uh, a, bl a blind uh, blank field large one 140 square degrees with very good uh, multi-wavelength uh, data in order to demonstrate and, and observe it at the depth expected for the old sky survey at the end of the four-year program so it's kind of a preview of how the x-ray sky will look like once zero zeta survey is finished and with that of course we then test our pipeline and our ability to identify sources and to characterize them. There has already been almost 20, 15 to 20 papers that, that came out during our early data release associated to this survey field. Survey fields are very rich once you uh, have put together this multi-wavelength information and these effects we hope will become one of the famous fields for wide field astronomers. Uh, here I'm showing the same field, but now uh, the uh, X-ray image, we have subtracted the point sources. What is left here is clusters, groups, and the diffuse emission in between them. So it's kind of a direct picture of the large scale structure. Uh, this is the same clusters now uh, color coded by the redshift. So we could use optical photometric redshift to identify this cluster and place them into the 3D. So for example, you see that there are objects with similar colors grouped together. These are the called super clusters. We have discovered a super cluster redshift 0.36. And then of course we can use the advantage of uh, measuring redshift to directly project this three dimensional large scale structure uh, into uh, a wedge, so to speak. But of course the UFETS field contains tens of thousands, almost 30,000 point sources. So the clusters are only the minority uh, of what constitute the typical X-ray sky population. 
And because we have such a good multivalent information, uh, we could identify all these 30,000 objects uh, with optical and in infrared satellites and data. And here is a color color plot of all the point sources we have identified in this field. In red, these are objects that we know are stars. In blue are objects we know are galaxy. So using this color, we can immediately uh, separate uh, X-ray emitting stars from X-ray emitting galaxies. And in among the galaxies in blue, we can separate quasars, active uh, rapidly accreting black holes, which populate this big cloud here on the left from normal galaxies, which populate this sequence and things in between, which are a mixture of obscured AGN and uh, galaxies. So I think this just to demonstrate how because of the large effective area, we can accumulate large statistics over population of different sorts. This is, for example, the X-ray emitting stars in the Gaia color magnitude plane. So because the X-ray emission is a signpost of coronal activity, fast rotation and strong magnetic fields, we can use Erosita uh, population statistics to learn about the infancy of main sequence stars, uh, but also their binarity, for example. And this is instead, when you look at the extragalactic population, we can use a combination of photometric and spectroscopic redshift. And this is just to show that Erosita, as most uh, X-ray blank fields, covers very wide redshift range. So we can study the evolution of black holes from the first uh, epochs close to reionization up to now. OK, I think this was my tour de force uh, about the performance verification phase. The main message was that we did, in fact, verify that the instrument was working fine. And then we started serving the sky. The way the, our all sky survey operates is in a yet a different mode. We don't point, we don't do this raster scan. We just let the telescope rotate continuously, as you see in this animation. And it takes about four hours to do a great circle. So in one day, we do six great circles. And we follow the motion of the L2 point around the sun. So uh, our field of view is one degree. And in one day, we move by one degree. So in uh, half a year, we can cover the entire celestial sphere. Here on the right, you see an animation of all these great circles. These are real data now. All these great circles intersecting at the south ecliptic pole. So the south ecliptic pole is covered essentially every four hours. And around, around it, you, you, uh, you fill in the old sky in six months. And as I said, the plan is to do that in an uninterrupted for four years. That will result in eight old sky surveys that we can compare, compare with each other. But of course, we can also stack in order to detect the faintest and more distant sources. Um, so right now, we have completed three old sky surveys, and we are in the middle of the fourth one. This is one slide coming from giving you some numbers about the first one. But of course, these numbers are uh, similar for the others. Uh, we have a uniform exposure over the old sky of about 200 seconds. So it's a shallow survey. Uh, this, this, of course, exposure goes up to almost 10 hours at the ecliptic pole. But because our telescope is big, we reach sensitivities of about 5 times 10 to minus 14 ergs per second per square centimeter in our most sensitive band, uh, 0.3 to 2.3 kV, and about a factor of 10 higher in the harder band. Because the background is so stable and we have flexible mission planning, we could cover the old sky without gaps. We have in total uh, downloaded about 80 gigabytes of, of good data. This corresponds to about 400 million calibrated photons in the 0.125 to kilo electron volt. And with this, at least our preliminary catalog that we are refining now, we detected about 1 million sources over the old sky. So this 1 million is an important milestone because it was, roughly speaking, the total number of X-ray sources known before Erosita launched. So in just six months, we have about doubled the number of known X-ray sources in the sky. And now I think with the third old sky survey, we are about you know, a factor of three to four more. OK, this is a picture. Now I'm showing you the old sky that we, the image of the old sky. This is uh, image in different energy band, quite heavily smoothed so that you can appreciate uh, the various structure. This is the range between one and 2.3 kilo electron volt. In this range, the X-ray sky is essentially dominated. Of course, in this projection, the Milky Way is in the horizon. The uh, galactic center is at the center of this image. You can see some residual structure due to Milky Way uh, uh, structures, but most of the sky looks pretty uniform. 
because at this energy we are dominated by the cosmic x-ray background which is simply the collection of photons coming from distant uh, agn and clusters and it's nice to overlay with that map the map of galaxy in the very local universe within 88 megaparsec this is from the tumas redshift survey if you look closely you can actually see the structures of you know the great attractor the virgo cluster here they are directly visible in the x-ray image as well as condensation of mostly clusters of course in fact the two mass redshift surveys have, have, over, have gone up about a factor of three in distance up to 0 0.08 redshift here you see some famous uh, structures so the Hakka cluster the uh, Shapley super cluster Virgo coma and in fact you could by eye recognize almost all of them in the x-ray image of the old sky with Rosita in this energy band so it's quite a spectacular way of directly seeing the large scale structure with your own eyes. Okay, this is the hard band I've shown you. If I now move at the opposite end uh, of the sensitive Erosita between 0.3 and 0.6 kilo electron volt, now you see something quite different. There is much more structured diffuse emission. You see the effect of the dust absorption of the Milky Way in this soft X-ray range. Of course, these soft X-ray photons are preferentially absorbed by dust. So you see these dark lanes that you didn't see in the harder X-ray maps. And then you see more structure because now at these uh, temperatures is the diffuse hot gas and the ISM of the Milky Way that becomes prominent. And in fact, in the medium uh, energy range between 0.6 and 1 kilo electron volt, this is where hot gas at a few millions Kelvin, which is supposedly the virial temperature of the Milky Way halo, should emit okay so in this energy range we should be most sensitive to the circumgalactic medium of the milky way and here you see something quite interesting with your own eyes directly you can see this almost uh, figure of eight bipolar structure this is reminiscent of the so-called fermi bubble so fermi is a gamma ray telescope for you from those of you who don't know who observe at, at completely different energies but uh, in particular or more than 10 years ago the Fermi people looking at the old sky gamma ray images realized that, especially the high energy above three giga, giga electron volt, there is a, a symmetric figure of eight coming from the galactic center. These are the small Fermi bubbles. This is now an overlay of Fermi above one GeV in red, where with the Fermi bubble in the center, with the Erosita medium band image that also show this figure of eight that seems to enclose the Fermi bubbles. It's even more clearly seen in the Rosita uh, medium energy band now, if we smooth a little bit subtracting the point sources, you clearly see these bubbles in the south and in the north. So we think we have discovered uh, uh, the complement of the Fermi bubble, probably something that resembles a very large scale, galactic scale, uh, hot wind, like the solar wind, in which uh, uh, the, the shock hot wind represents fields in the Fermi bubbles. The Fermi bubble boundary represents the contact discontinuity with the shock interstellar medium, and the Erosita bubble profile trace the shock front of this expanding wind. So you can use this model and calculate some very basic energetics. For example, the total thermal energy content of the Erosita bubbles is about 10 times that of the Fermi bubble. If this is truly contact discontinuity, it's just the volume ratio of these two. Uh, structures and this is about 10 to the 56 years so maybe uh, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 supernova the equivalent of that uh, the age of this bubble you can uh, guesstimate by the Mach number of the shock front uh, and, the, and the distance it traveled it should be a few tens of million years so you need an energy release about 10 to the 41 earths per second to power these bubbles and this is still possible to do with either uh, uh, energy injection from Sagittarius A star or a past starburst. So now, I think this was the, our first major discovery. It was published in Nature last year of this uh, structure in the hail of the Milky Way. Uh, now I'm putting back all these three images that I've shown you before. And now I can show you in full glory the old sky as seen by Rosita in which different color represent different energy band exactly as I've shown you. And here you can see 
uh, an annotated view of that image in which we remarked some of the most striking features. This uh, very bright source, it looks an extended, but in fact is the, the brightest X-ray source. This was the first X-ray source discovered by Giacconi, extrasolar X-ray source. This is Scorpius X1. It's the brightest X-ray source in the sky. It appears extended just because it fills the wings of our PSF up to several degrees. It's so bright. Um, but we, we do detect some very famous uh, sources in the history of X-ray astronomy, like Cygnus X1, the Crab Pulsar, Orion. This is the Vela Supernova remnants. And as you move away from the galactic plane, we have Coma, Virgo, many clusters, the Perseus cluster, and even some of these small dots. If you zoom in, I can assure you, I have personally went and looked for the counterpart of the points, bright point source here. This corresponds to a redshift three quasar. So we span a very wide range of distances from the sun, from a few hundred uh, parsec to uh, several gigaparsec in just one image. Uh, this is now a zoom in animated view of the low, gal low galactic latitude, the so to speak Milky Way in Technicolor. Here you see the Cygnus uh, loop region with Cygnus X1, Cygnus X2, and various uh, supernova remnants. Here you see the galactic center. Of course, everything looks bluer towards the center of the galaxy because only the hard photons come through the dust. And this is now again the Vila supernova remnants, one of the largest X-ray supernova remnants. I'm going to now show you a zoom in on Vila uh, because it's quite spectacular. And also because in the same field, this is a few degree wide field taken from the Old Sky Survey, we have actually three supernova remnants which are unrelated to each other. They are different distances at different ages. Vila is the largest one, is pretty old, uh, very large uh, mixed thermal structure you see in the, in the remnant ejecta. Pupi says the same uh, image I've shown you before. It's not the same image, but the same supernova I've shown you before is much more compact, is younger, brighter. And here you see it's called Vela Junior. This is a non-thermal supernova remnant that is almost perfectly circular because it, it's, uh, it's younger and you see in bluish the non-thermal emission from the shock, expanding shock of this younger supernova remnant. We have discovered also a few new ones this one in particular is one of the largest, if not, I think, the largest supernova remnant discovered in X-rays. is about four degrees in diameter. So you can imagine that you need the unlimited view, field of view of Erosita in order to detect these uh, things. And this is a composition of X-ray in purple and radio in, in, in green. And we are now going through systematically our images in order to see whether we can detect a few more missing or unknown and previously non supernova remnants. And one last uh, highlight of you know, galactic uh, science, we can go all the way from uh, energetic events to planet hosting stars. Uh, with Erosita, we have detected a large fraction, maybe 10 to 15% of in X-rays of all known planet hosting stars out of the Kepler fields. Uh, and so we have a very large repository of interesting system to go and study in greater detail. So we have many new detection of planet hosting stars. Here, the group led by Katja Popenegger in Potsdam has submitted a paper, it's actually now published, uh, in which they report the sample statistics of this X-ray planet hosting star. So of course it is important to understand the effect the X-rays may have on the atmosphere of the planets. Uh, and in particular here, she points uh, me at this uh, nearby multi-planet system with three Neptunian planets. Uh, and, and knowing a bit better the property of the X-ray emitting star is important to understand how the uh, envelopes and, and the atmosphere of this planet can be retained or not. The last point I wanna make in the last uh, five to 10 minutes is to tell you a little bit more about what we have discovered by taking advantage of the fact that we can coming back to the same location in the sky uh, multiple times. So the exploration of the time domain with the Rosita is quite interesting because of the way we conduct the survey. So purely from the uh, mission design point of view, but also because the X-ray sky is iner inherent, inherently quite variable. We are looking at compact sources, uh, energetic sources. So variability is at quite common features, more common definitely than in optical or radio astronomy. 
so one word about how we interact with the spacecraft. We don't have 24 seven contact with SRG, but we only dumped the data once per day. We have a four to five years long contact in which we dumped the data to uh, the Russian uh, deep space antenna network. Uh, the data are telemetered down to Moscow and directly then copied to MPE, where our system converts the telemetry into FITS files. And so immediately, as soon as we receive the data of the past 24 hours, we branched the data into two. Uh, one is this called near real time analysis of NRTA, which was designed for our instrument team to check the health of the instrument in real time or, say, or near real time. But of course, we can also perform some very basic search for luminous transient. And we have a system in which essentially you compare a model of the sky that you know with the new observation. And this generates quite a large number of triggers per day. Now we have vetted, uh, and I think we have improved them. Maybe it's uh, down to 50 to 100 triggers per day. Some of them are false triggers, but many of them are real transients, the majority of which are coronal flares from nearby stars. Uh, and then the second branch is the science analysis in which the FITS converted file are then passed to our uh, standard processing that on a weekly basis, analyzes the sky in different fields uh, with a very detailed background measurement and detect source and upload the new deep catalog uh, that then we, we can uh, access, the entire science team can access. So because of our way of doing scans, I want to just to remind you what are the time scale of interest for us. So the shortest possible time scale we, we can detect any variability is 50 milliseconds. This is the time resolution of our CCDs. 40 seconds is the uh, exposure time. So the time a source passed through the field of view. So our typical exposure for a single scan. Uh, as I told you, we have six scan in a day. So a source is typically observed six times 40 every four hours. Every four hours, we have 40 second exposure for a total of about six times. Uh, during a day. And then the source disappears from our view. And typically, we come back to the same parts of the sky only six months afterwards. So here, for example, is a patch of the sky that was observed. It's a galactic uh, low latitude patch of the sky. At six months apart, you see variable sources popping everywhere. This is the most prominent one. Of course, what makes this field particularly interesting is not the variable sources, but this is very peculiar ring-like structure. This ring is centered on a known transient that went into outburst. It's a, a black hole X-ray binary candidate. They went into outburst about one year before our observation. So this beautiful circle is actually the light echo of this old transient. And exactly what's going on is simply to explain, we have X-ray emerging from this transient in, in uh, early 2019. Along the way, they interact with dust, with the dust lane, and they get scattered. And some of these scattered photon get scattered back to us. And so we see this expanding light echo um, of the scattered light. So if we, in this simple setup, if we know the time of the event, and you know the distance of the dust, you can measure the distance of the transient. And this is not so easy to do in general for X-ray binaries, because they tend to have faint counterpart. So we could reconstruct the dust distribution along the line of sight towards the source, and we can place the source uh, to quite accurate distance at about uh, three point something uh, kiloparsec from us. It's one of the best known distance to a stellar mass black hole, in fact. And with that, then we can also measure quite accurately the luminosity of the black hole, which is important to study the physics of this transit. Another interesting area, and this is my last uh, point, is the search for transient not in the Milky Way, but in the nuclei of nearby galaxies. These are associated to exotic form of AGN activity. So we think we can detect either stars being disrupted by supermassive black hole or very uh, peculiar intermittent activity. And here, I don't want to go into the detail. Essentially, this is telling you that we do search periodically for uh, transient, so objects that appear uh, at six months distance and then disappear again in one of our old sky surveys. Uh, to give you an idea, in about one year of these searches, 
we have found about 420 transient clearly associated objects that were only present in one of our old sky survey by a significant number associated to nuclear nearby galaxies. 150 of them has flux variability more than a factor of 10. So these are really exceptional flares. Uh, and 60 of them are, are extremely soft in X-rays. This is interesting because this is expected signature of a star being disrupted by supermassive black hole. Probably the most exotic of these nuclear transient are the so-called quasi-periodic eruption. I want to report that uh, before I finish in one minute. Here you see one light curve of one uh, source. Here, each point is our 40 second ex exposure observed every four hours. As you can see, the source immediately struck us because uh, the source was consistent with the background and then every eight hours, we see a very clear detection, okay? And this happened three times over one day and a half. And this is the spectrum of the source in the high state uh, in yellow and in the low state in red. We immediately trigger uh, XMM follow-up of this source so we can pinpoint the location better than Erosita. So we can clearly see this come from the nucleus of this galaxy. We took a spectrum of the galaxy, which turns out to be a normal star forming galaxy with no AGN signature. So pretty interesting. And we found two of these objects. Now I'm showing you the XMM follow-up light curve of this uh, on the bottom for the object number two, QPE2, Hero QPE2. And the same object as shown you before has been followed up by NICER because its uh, duty cycle is so long it basically does one burst every day. He said it takes, with XMM neutron, it's not feasible to do that such long monitoring campaign. But essentially we have two systems that does this quasi-periodic bursting. It looks like heartbeat. That was never, it was only seen before in two other cases, okay? So we have doubled the number of these quasi-periodic eruption known. These are nuclear, very low massive galaxies. So these are not your typical AGN population. The, the mass of the host galaxy is pretty low and the star formation is either in the passive or in the star bursting galaxies. So we still don't know what they are. In this paper led by a student of ours, Ricardo Arcodia in Nature, uh, we can rule out some models that can predict these uh, variabilities. For example, known instability of accretion disk, they do not explain the observed duty cycle or relationship between amplitude and, and period. Uh, of course, there could be other instability models that we have not explored yet, uh, yet to be analyzed. But one intriguing possibility is, in fact, this semi-periodic or quasi-periodic eruption are due to some sort of binary system. And this is potentially quite interesting because it could either be interacting with a stellar uh, compact object or uh, stars, uh, uh, being uh, periodically stripped uh, by uh, rush lobe overflow as they go close to the central black hole, or even stars interacting with the pre-existing uh, material, either in a, in a dead accretion disk or in, in other form of uh, material around the black hole. What makes this particularly interesting is that if you have the ability to constrain the period derivative, then you can put uh, prediction on the gravitational wave emission of this uh, interesting periodic signature. So we will be looking forward, we will be looking closely at this object. Okay, I am now five minutes beyond my assignated time and this is really time to stop. I just want to conclude by saying that uh, Erosita on SRG has been in operation for more than two years. All subsystems are working with, non, with minimal, in fact, uh, almost uh, no, no clear losses with respect to the design performance. As I said, we have completed more than three old sky surveys, almost four, in fact, in uh, Mid-December, we will have complete four, and we have 4.3 to go. Um, but the main message is that thanks to a large grasp, so combination of field of view and effective area, stable background, and observing cadence, Erosita is opening up already now parameter space for X-ray astronomy in different fields, from planets to uh, cosmology. If that's as our performance verification survey field, was a good demonstrator that this all sky survey design requirement can be met. And then we are hopeful that eventually in 2025 and so on, we can be, we can be, we will be able to uh, harvest our major cosmological analysis goal. In general, I would say the completed all sky survey 
uh, will represent a unique legacy data set for high energy astrophysics that given the current landscape of future mission will not be surpassed for many years. And with this, I will thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was a lovely overview of all this new discovery space. <laughs> all right. Um, so we can now take questions and uh, we already have some in the chat, but you can still also raise your hand uh, and we will then proceed to unmute you and, and give you the microphone. So just to begin with, um, the first question which came through on the chat, and I'm going to read this out, um, was from Will Wall, I think triggered by roughly slide 20 or slide 21. Mm -hmm. um, what are the typical integration times needed for obtaining those superb images? Yes. Let me go back to that slide. Um, so um, the, the, this image was taken with uh, about 10 kilosecond exposure on average. The central bit was exposed a bit longer. I think it's between eight and 10 kilosecond on average over the field. Yeah. So uh, this is still, we can of course go deeper. For example, the, oh, no, that was before. The, the, cl the comma cluster or the able, the merging cluster, these were observed. These are more like uh, 60 to 80 kilosecond exposure. And maybe comma is in between 25, 30. So I think there is quite a lot of room for doing interesting R degree or tens of degree size field at 10 to 20 kilosecond, because our old sky survey will never go deeper than two kilosecond anyway. Okay, so if, if I may, just on the topic of clusters, I mean, I was wondering, so the, the cluster cosmology science you, you are doing and are planning on doing also, um, is the largest improvement there from sheer numbers, or is there also a significant contribution from your ability to, to identify better relaxed versus unrelaxed clusters and, and, and things like that? If you, in, in relative terms, what is yes. more important? Um, I think, well, I, I, I think the, all, the huge leap is in the sheer number is in the sheer number and in general I would say in the purity of the sample because the x-ray uh, detection is quite clean it's definitely cleaner than optical selection it suffer much less from projection effect of foreground structures probably uh sunayev zeldovich submillimeter uh, selection based on on the sunayev zeldovich effect is as clean, but they typically don't have our spatial resolution. And in terms of sensitivity, Rosita is still winning in terms of providing number of sources. Of course, once you have a, a mass this large samples that give you a very large uh, edge in terms of reducing your statistical uncertainty, unfortunately, we still will have to fight against complex uh, systematic effects, especially into relation relating our actual observable to the underlying mass of the cluster. And our strategy right now that we have tested quite successfully in EFETS is to rely on lensing, uh, on, on lensing surveys. So in EFETS, we, we make use of the fantastic Subaru HSC imaging. But you know, in the long term, LSST and Euclid and DES, there will be plenty of lensing surveys that can calibrate our masses. So I think the combination of the X-ray selection with the lensing calibration eventually will will hopefully bring us where we want to be okay thank you um there's another one uh, in the chat which uh, i believe you can see as well andrea is from isabel grenier uh, it's quite a long one which is why it's might maybe best if you can look at it yes, directly I'm, I'm looking at that now so it is to do with the Yes. bubbles. Oh yes, that's a, a very good question. So I, I on purpose 
skimmed over that just for the sake of time. But I think this is an interesting, very open debate about whether what we call the Rosita bubbles are solely due to uh, these galactic size structures. I would say that the southern lobe morphology is unequivocal. But as you probably know, this very bright northern part of the that we could associate with the bubbles is this called North Polar Spur, well known since Rosa time. And in fact, there is a quite heated debate whether this is a much local effect. There are definitely associated radio structures in the sky that don't have this figure of eight symmetry that according to different lines of analysis, looking at the radio polarization property, looking at the Gaia extinction long line of sight would indicate they are much closer in at hundreds of parcels. What I suspect, but I think we have the data to try to model that because we have spectra from our X-ray images everywhere. What I suspect is that the North Polar Spur is probably a, the bright end of it is a local thing that in projection in projection masks some of the real bubbles. So it's probably a combination of two things. We have a projection effect between local structure nearby and something genuinely associated to the galactic center. But I mean, this is just a suspicion. We are now working on our data to model, for example, modeling the absorption along the line of sight in different locations and the bubbles to try to constrain their distances more accurately. Thank you. Isabel, are you happy with that? Or do you want to ask any follow-up? If so, you can raise your hand and we'll, we'll unmute you. She said, great, thanks. So maybe for the time being, that's it. Okay. okay. All right, so then uh, one more from the chat uh, by Anatoly Vasilenko. Is the raw data, or at least partially raw, available publicly for spectral analysis uh, of the point sources now? If so, where can it be downloaded and what software is needed? Yes, good question. Let me go back to this. Something is available. So in, in July, we have released all the CalPV data from the German uh, team. Uh, so no old sky survey data has yet been made public. This will be made public. If you're interested in the old sky, this will happen end of next year. But if you want to have an idea of how the data look like, and if you want to try your software, what you can do is to go here. Here you see on the bottom of this slide, that's the MP website of the early data release. Well, of course, there is a publication list, but if you go to this erositmpmpg.de slash edr, then you'll find the raw data and the software. Uh, the software that we that the team has developed is uh, an evolution of uh, standard uh, X-ray analysis software. It inherited a lot of the XMM Newton SAS. So if someone is familiar to X-ray data reduction from say XMM Newton or Chandra, it should not be too difficult to navigate through that. But there is both the software and uh, the uh, a basic manual for it. Everything is available here on this EDR web page. Okay, so in addition to questions, lots of congratulations on a good talk coming through as well. Um, together with uh, appreciation of your talk, Andrea Annalia Longinotti asks, can you comment on the X-ray chimneys? Does Erosita have any chance to see them? Does it see them already? Oh, that's a good question. Ciao, Analia. The, um, well, of course, we do cover the region of the chimneys. These are relatively small scale, right? Uh, these are a few degrees. Um, so we haven't looked into much detail of that. It's also because the, our old sky survey exposure in that region is quite shorter. So the XMM data are far superior to the Rosita data. And also, uh, we suffer, we, we are not that sensitive above 2 kV, so we suffer quite a lot from extinction. Um, so in fact, the, 
I cannot really answer the question whether we have seen them yet. Uh, but Gabriele Ponti, who is you know one of the discoverer that have, is working on the XMM uh, heritage program, uh, would be able to tell you if you ask him. Okay. So so let's say the, the, for us, just to conclude, the synergy with the XMM program is on larger scales is in the interface between the chimneys and the Fermi bubbles or the Rosita bubbles. That's where the Rosita will win eventually, just covering tens of square degrees. All right, and then uh, Will Wall again. Yeah. Um, does the E-Rosita data capture any solar system objects? Uh, good question. Um, well, for uh, it's not that easy, given our scanning strategy and field of view. I think we have looked into the possibilities to capture any, and probably we will not. Um, but uh, we did an experiment during our CAPIB phase that was led by Conrad Denner, and we did pointed, we did look at the comet. It was one, not one of the brightest comets. Unfortunately, I don't remember the, the telephone name of it, but we do have a detection of a comet, just almost as a as a. Um, proof of principle that we could do it. Um, I'm not sure eventually a, a publication will come out of that, uh, but we, we did detect it, we did, we did observe and detect a comet. And I think the solar system physics group right now is quite interested in looking at the um, background vari temporal variation on six months time scale there are hints that we are looking at some uh you know charge exchange phenomenon on on uh, larger scale uh, essentially solar wind interaction um, with um, the earth uh, sphere but uh, th this is still on, in in the world Okay, and then one yeah, final one. X ray, uh, comet in X rays have been, uh, William is saying, is unexpected, but uh, since Rosat, we have, in fact, surprisingly discovered that through charge exchange interaction of the solar wind with the comet tail, comet can emit in X rays, and, and a number of them have been, have been studied already with uh, Exxon, Newton, and Chandra. Good. Um, one more, uh, namely from Dimitra Kutrompa, and I think you can see this as well, uh, probably Andrea. So the question is, do you have any indication of background variability due, due to heliospheric SWCX? Yes. This and maybe you started. can explain what SWCX is for people in the audience who are not familiar with the acronym. Yeah, this is solar wind charge exchange. Is this physical process by which uh, charge particles from the solar wind can exchange charges with neutral ions in, you know, upper atmosphere. I mean, I, I, I hope I'm not saying something to this is not really my field, but, and in this way, producing a, sp a specific signature at X-ray in, in particular X-ray emission lines typically. And I think the short answer is, please watch this space, but we do, we do have some indication of uh, background variability due to aerospheric. Uh, yeah, I think the answer is yes. But you know, it's we are looking closely to make sure we are not being fooled by other weird systematic effects. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for that talk. Thanks for taking time to address all these questions. Um, as I said in opening, the next Game Changer seminar will be a week from today on the 4th of November, and it will be given by Swiss astronaut Claude Nicolier uh, on the topic of human spaceflight, where are we going? So thank something you, to look forward to there. Um, thank thanks for joining and uh, see you next time. And Andrea, maybe we can briefly stay online just before we disconnect uh, yes. totally from the system. <laughs> sure. Thank you.